Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Kurt Flinchball, and I'm fired up to be here. So the title of today's lesson is Miracle Moments. And so please be open to your Bibles to John chapter 9. You know, many of us yesterday uh, gathered together at the Chris Kindle Mart. You know, it's taken me a year being out here to feel like I say that correctly without hesitation. But we went to the Chris Kindle Mart. I don't know what it is about Chris Kindle Marts, but they don't like the letter E. They don't use it. It's not in the word where it should be the two times. Amen. And so we went. We had a great time. But, I, you know, today actually marks the one-year anniversary of the first interest meeting we had for the planting. And so a year ago today, a few of us gathered at the Steel Stacks for the Chris Kindle Mart. And it began, and you know, we planned this, and it wasn't supposed to snow, and we talked about Christmas, and if we were going to have our first interest meeting, it had to be in Bethlehem in Christmas time. Because Bethlehem at Christmas, is there really a better way to start? Amen? And so we gathered together for this, and, and the day before, we, we, we came up, and we had people drive from Philly, from Virginia, and as people were ready to travel, the forecast changed to snow. But we decided to move forward, and it was the most beautiful day. I remember leaving feeling like God was just magically showing us that it's going to be awesome. Because it was just enough snow to be beautiful, but all the roads were clear. Amen? Yeah. And we had a great time. And it's crazy because I remember having this interest meeting. And I remember gathering together, and I, and I remember getting there early, as is my custom. And I remember we had about 20 people who said they were going to come, and, you know, we got there early. And there was four of us. And you start getting worried. As much as you want to trust that people are good hearted and they're just running late, you, you start going, man, is everyone having second thoughts? Did the snow scare people away? And I just remember sitting there and, and praying that for God to help me surrender that he's in control. Amen. And at that time, as this meeting happened, to my knowledge, there were four of us that were going to be part of this church. Christina, myself, and the Maritas. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, okay. If it's four of us, it's four of us. God will move. And, and I remember praying and I remember being in awe of that day and just being blown away. And we went out afterwards and we went to eat and we, we hung out and we ate some food and we fellowshiped together. And, and, and I left and I just remember having so much fun and, and really for the first time, like I could almost taste the planting. I, it was like right there. You can almost feel and breathe the air of being out here and being on the mission and, and believing what God could do. And I remember sitting at dinner, you know, and, and we're all sitting at dinner, and I remember sitting next to, uh, to Dan Burke. And at the time, Dan was highly considering coming. He, he was uh, self-diagnosed, like 95% sure that he was going to be there. And I remember sitting next to Dan and looking around at the table, and, and I just remember sitting there being like, dude, a year from now, we're going to be back here at the Chris Kindle Mart, and we're going to celebrate all that God has done. And we remember, and we just sat there, and we almost got, like, giddy talking about, like, what if God does this? And, and what, if, what if we actually get 30 people? Like, I remember that idea of, like, what if we have 30 people in church? Like, whoa! And, like, and you're just, like, so, like, whoa, I almost don't want to say it, because what if God doesn't do it? And, and we sat there, and we dreamed these dreams. And, and to sit here now and to, to average 55 adults a week plus children to see what God has done, it, it's amazing to look back, Amen. And so it's incredible to be here and to look back and to see what God has done, but I'm convinced that he's not done yet, amen? And that God has so much more work that he wants us to do. And so we're going to continue our sermon series on miraculous and looking at the miracles of Jesus and specifically looking at what the miracles teach us about his power and his person and how we can imitate it. And then John chapter 9 verse 1 it says, as he went along... He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now before we jump in, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you have done such incredible things, Father. I thank you that you have an amazing plan and that sinners such as ourselves, people that are imperfect and flawed such as us, that we get to be part of that plan. Father, that we get to be the instruments by which you show your love, your compassion, and your mercy to this world. Father, we thank you for that honor and that privilege. Father, we pray that we never lose sight of what a gift that is, 
But we also never lose sight of what a responsibility that is. What an awesome and amazing responsibility it is to show your true love to the world. Father, we pray for this lesson. If there's anything I'm about to say that you don't want said, remove it from my lips. If there's anything I haven't thought of that you once said, put it on my heart. Father, said each of us may leave hearing what you want us to hear, so it may leave knowing you greater and more equipped and willing to make you known. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is walking along in the Gospel of John, and he sees this man who has been born blind. He's suffered blindness since his birth. And what's interesting about this is this is actually the only miracle in the Gospels that points out that the affliction has been there since birth. There's a chance that some of the other miracles were that situation, but we're not told that. This is the only time in the Gospels. There, there are later two then occurrences in, in the book of Acts of this, but the first time that in the Gospels we are brought to the attention of this affliction that Jesus wants to heal being from birth. Not being something that happened as they, they grew old or as they lived their life. And the disciples see this man and they respond in a very human way. They see the suffering of this man and, and that the reality of his situation confronts their theology. It confronts their view of the world. You know, in, in this time in Judaism, there was a common thought that all suffering was a result of our sin. That any suffering in my life must be a result of sins that I have committed or that have been done to me or around me. And so they look at this man and they're confronted with the common hell notion that sin or that suffering is a result of our sin. That we are at fault for our suffering. And they see this man who's been blind since birth and, and that idea of that it's a just suffering starts to confront the reality of his situation and, and they can't figure it out. And so they pull Jesus aside and say, well, well Jesus, who... Who sinned? Him or his parents? Did, did he somehow sin in utero? Did he somehow sin before birth? Or, or, or was it the fault of his parents? How, how does this match up with the way that we view suffering? Now the truth is, as humans, we're, we're not far from this same thinking a lot of times. But a lot of times we look at pain and we look at the suffering of our lives and the world around us and it's much easier to deal with pain if we can assign blame. It's much easier to accept the suffering we see in this world if somehow we're able to assign blame to the darkness that we see. And so the disciples, in seeing this man, instead of enacting a sense of trying to give him love and healing and mercy and trying to get involved in his suffering, they stand as judge. And they want to know who's at fault. And the truth is, this question of suffering is a reason that many people struggle with the idea of God. How can suffering happen if God is good? And who is to blame? And, and this question is not something new. You know, if you struggle with that question of like, how can, how can there be suffering in the world if God exists? You, you're not alone. That question has been asked since the dawn of time. And Jesus begins to give us an answer in verse 3. It says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. What's interesting is Jesus refuses to stand in the place of judgment on this man's suffering. And instead, as we're about to see, he takes the role of caregiver. Instead of assigning blame for why the situation is going on, he gets involved and offers help. Now, if you read... Through the entire Bible, you see that suffering can be a result of many different factors. Now, suffering can be a result of the fact that we have an enemy. That there is evil in the world and Satan wants to attack us and, and wants to destroy us. And he knows that he can do nothing to hurt God. And so he decides to hurt his children. Right? I'm, I'm a pretty big guy. Right? I'm, I'm a pretty tough guy too. Right? Like I have a scar on my face and some of you don't know what it's from. But I, if you've got a scar over your right eye, you're a pretty tough guy, right? Normally, I'm depicted as the villain. In most movies, when you see someone with a scar on their eye, they're a villain, right? Like, they're seen as like the bad guy. I'm not allowed to wear black dress shirts anymore because everyone thinks like I look like a villain for the Lord, right? And, <laughs> and you sit there, and I'm a big guy. I'm a tough guy. I'm a pretty well-centered guy. I worked in riot control for three years. I've had people try to stab me. I've been spit on, kicked, uh, punched, stomped, yelled at, maliciously urinated towards. It's insane. <laughs> and I did all that with a smile. I was able to stand there and just go, it's okay, we're going to help you. 
There's not much that you can do to me to hurt me. But if you hurt my son, you destroy me. There's nothing Satan can do to God, but he can hurt his children. And so there's suffering because we have an enemy. There's suffering because there's free will and humans are flawed and we choose to hurt each other. And we choose to act in our own definitions of right and wrong. And, and so we hurt the people around us and, and we, we put other people's needs down in honor of our own. And sometimes we suffer because we're just not smart. Sometimes we do things that are just foolish and we have to face that, right? And there's not always an easy answer to suffering. Sometimes there is no logical reason. Sometimes it's just the fact of a fallen world, the fact that we no longer live in, in the perfect Garden of Eden without suffering or pain. And he looks at the suffering, and instead of Jesus standing as judge and determining who's at fault, he takes the role of caregiver. And he says that regardless of why this man's suffering, it's going to be used for the glory of God. What's amazing about Christianity is the Bible never promises that becoming a Christian means life will be all roses and rainbows. In fact, it says the opposite. Right? There are verses that say, if you want to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Like, if Paul could have left out any part of his letters that the Holy Spirit wanted him to write, that's the one verse I wish he had just left out. <laughs> like, come on, Paul! Like, you just made it a promise that it's going to be harder at times because I'm a Christian. That there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be pain, that, that, that in some ways being a Christian can even make life more difficult at times. The Bible never promises that pain will go away because we follow Jesus. But what it does promise is that pain can be used for good. That as a Christian, no pain is wasted. There is never a moment of suffering that is wasted because God takes it and is able to mold it to glorify himself and his people. That God can take every moment of suffering, everything that's going on in a life, and use it to glorify himself. Now, I love, we, we stand up here every week and we pray for Russell McLaughlin and, and we pray for Marcia. And Russ has not set foot in our church service yet. Because the whole time we've been building the church team, the whole time we've been preparing for the mission team, they, they joined as soon as they found out about it. They signed up and said, we're in. But he was down in Philly getting a, a double lung and heart transplant. Hospital for over a year. And yet he continues to face every challenge. And Marcia continues to face every challenge, striving to trust in God. And what's incredible is every one of us that's ever gone to try to visit them in the hospital, you know, I, for me, I always go in trying to, like, all right, Kurt, like, get ready to be giving. And like, you know how sometimes, like, you just got to get ready to be super giving? You know, like, you're just tired or whatever. It's, it's normal life. And I was like, all right, Kurt, like, get your heart rate, get energetic, be ready to really, really give. And I leave feeling like he gave to me. Like, I leave inspired. And I'm like, well, this is backwards. This isn't the way it's supposed to go. But that's the power when you have God through suffering. And the truth is, whether you decide to be a Christian or not, there will be suffering in this life because the world has fallen. It's just whether or not that suffering will equate to anything good. God uses that suffering. So Jesus says, this man's suffering, you know, regardless of why it's there, I know what it's going to be used for, to glorify him. You know what's crazy? 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about it. People all over the world are still talking about what God did through this man's pain. In verse 4, Jesus goes on and he says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You now Jesus says that, that he's going to use this situation for the glory of God. And then he says something amazing. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Why? Because night is coming. That the opportunity to do good, the opportunity to use situations in life for the glory of God, they are all around us, but they're passing by. That we do not have an infinite amount of time to try to make a difference. What's crazy is you think about what a moment is, right? Like, what defines a moment? How, how quick is a moment? Is it an hour? Is it a minute? Is it a second? 
Is it a tenth of a second? Like, what, what is a moment? And our lives are they're built upon billions and billions of these moments, these, these one-second interactions, these 30-second things, these, these conversations, these emails, these, all these different millions and millions of moments compounded upon each other. They make up our life. But our lives are defined by a few moments that we truly seized. That you look back on your life up to this moment, and it's consisted of millions of small moments, but only a few of them really mattered. Only a few of those moments were fully seized and changed the direction of your life. If you think about every gigantic, life-changing, history-altering event, through the course of time, every one of them began in a single moment. The snap of a finger. A few seconds. And what Jesus is saying is that we have these incredible moments, these incredible opportunities to, to see miracles, to have our lives and the lives of people around us radically changed. It's just whether or not we grab them. It's whether or not we take that moment and live it. Moments, every moment, has a God-inspired potential within it. Every moment has a God-inspired potential to see something amazing. But they pass us by. You know, I think a lot of times we tend to look at miracles as these massive, overwhelming, impossible things that could only happen in someone else's life. They can only happen to someone who has more faith than me or, or more time than me. Or, and we look at these things and we have all these excuses why miracles and, and these incredible stories of God and these incredible moments in life could only happen to somebody else. But the truth is, every miracle starts in a moment. It only takes a moment to have a miracle. He says something else interesting here. He says... As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Now here Jesus is saying, I have this fleeting moment, this, this specific instance where I can change this man's life, where, where I can do something incredible, and, and rather than standing as judge, I can show him the love of God. Not the religious world around him and not the way he's been put down, but to show him God's true identity. And I have this moment, he's about to act in that moment and do something amazing in that moment. But he says, as long as it is day, as long as we still have these moments, we must act. It's we, not he. Jesus doesn't say, as long as it is day, I must act. He doesn't say, as long as it is day, the Son of Man must act. He says, as long as it is day, we must act. We must do the work of him who sent me. Those moments, those God-ordained, miraculous moments, those, those moments that have the potential to change lives aren't just for Jesus' life. They're put before each one of us. It's not a question of if. It's a question of time. It's not a question of if God will give you a moment to be changed or if God will give you the moment to change someone else. It's a question of will you use that time to grab hold of it or you let it slip by. And when you look at an hourglass, once that sand falls through, you, you, you can't force that one moment to go back up. But each one of us has these amazing God-ordained moments, these incredible potential moments and it's not a question of if, it's a question of are you going to grab them in time? In faith, will you act? Will you allow God to do something fantastic? Or out of fear, will you hesitate? You know, a few weeks ago, we had a massive snowstorm, right? And, and so the news called for one to three inches. Where I live in Whitehall, we got seven. And the news called for one to three, and we knew about it for about a week. We knew snow was coming. We knew at least one to three inches of snow was coming. 
and we did not prepare. And we meaning like all of the Lehigh Valley. Like it just was not good, right? Like roads were not salt. It just was not a good situation. And what's crazy is we had all this time to prepare and we knew about it weeks in advance and I, I knew it was coming. I didn't know it was gonna be seven inches so I didn't prepare for seven inches. I prepared for like one to three, right? And, and so I had my schedule changed a little bit because of one to three inches. And, and so, I, and as we're driving out, within the first 10 minutes of the snowstorm, we already had an inch and a half on the ground. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm changing everything today because this is not gonna end well. And so I actually drove Val home from work because I'd picked him up to go to a Bible study and we realized there was too much snow to do that. So we altered our, our plans, right? Which I encourage all of us to do when we get seven inches of snow next time. Just look at how we can alter plans, amen? And so what happens is we're driving and I'm driving back from picking up Val and I'm, I'm taking all these back roads and I'm getting through the snow and taking my time and, and I'm driving through this neighborhood. And there's already about three inches of snow on the ground at this point. And I'm driving through this neighborhood and, and as I turn the corner real slow, I look over and no lie, there's a gentleman probably in his 40s or 50s sitting on a riding lawnmower mowing his lawn. <laughs> three inches of snow on the ground and he's got like a towel over his face and like gloves on and like a death grip. And he's like, mm, like mowing his lawn. And I had to stop. I have all wheel drive so I can kind of stop and stuff. So I stopped and I just like watched for a minute. And I was like, what is this guy doing? And at first I thought maybe he didn't have a snowblower and he was trying to like get the sidewalk clear. I was like, it doesn't make sense, but it makes more sense than mowing your lawn in three inches of snow. And sure enough, I watch and he's doing like, you know how you do like good lines too? Like, you know how when you mow lawn, you care, you do like, you design it at an angle. He's like mowing his lawn at an angle. I was like, what are you doing? If it hadn't already taken me an hour and a half to get home, I would have stopped and talked to him. But I was like, it's already been an hour and a half. I need to go. And I just watched this man mowing his lawn in three inches of snow. And I was like, that's someone who didn't take an opportunity when it came. That guy had plenty of moments. Plenty of opportunity to mow that lawn before the snow came. And in fact, when it first started snowing, he had one last moment to mow the lawn before all he's doing is pushing snow around. When we miss our moments, it's ineffective. Where in your life are you mowing snow? It's funny, but that's how we got to think about it. Where in your life is God opening doors and you're hesitating? Where is God giving you the opportunity to have your life change, to decide to trust him and, and jump in and follow and out of fear you're kind of white knuckling at me like I need more answers? Where in your life is God giving you a moment to change another life and you're hesitating? You will have no greater regret than missed moments at the end of your life. Those God-given potentials. Where are you letting miracles pass you by? I only have two points today, super quick, but we're going to look at what are the two ways in this passage that we see these moments being seized. My first point is miracle moments. John 9, verse 6. It says, After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go! He told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So first of all, you, you guys have heard me do this a few times. I think we, we can read the scriptures a little too like sanitized. It says he spit on the ground and made mud. This is a desert. That's not just like too mud. That's like, imagine being the blind man. Like here, you hear people talking around you and, and, and you're like, okay, like, it's something, like you, maybe they're going to give you money. Maybe they're going to help you. And also you hear one of them go, it's for the glory of God. And you're like, what is happening? Like, I believe for me, I'd be like, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, what is about to happen here? Like, again, I worked in riot control in psych, and I've been, like, I've had all types of crazy bodily functions, sh like, thrown at me out of anger. But the one thing that triggered you is, like, I've had kids try to stab me. Someone spit on me, and you're like, <sighs> or, like, I had a kid try to stab me, and I blocked, and I was like, it's okay, he needs a lot of help. Same kid went, too, and I was like, someone tagged me out. 
I need to leave this room. This is not going to be good. <laughs> like, I need to keep my salvation right now. Like, there's something about spit that is just, ugh. Yep, yep, yep. Right? There's some people who are like, okay, Kurt, stop talking about it. It grosses me out. So why does Jesus spit on the ground, make mud, and put it on the guy's eyes? All right, well, we don't know. We, the scriptures don't say. I, <laughs> a few thoughts. One is that at the time, there was the common held notion that saliva held medicinal value. And so what do I mean by that? If you burn your finger, what's the first thing you do? Every one of us, right? And so there was, Liz is like, uh-uh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Most of us, if you burn your finger, are like, ow, right? So there's the common hell notion that I'll wash my hands before I shake anyone's hand after service, I promise, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's the common hell notion that, that saliva had some type of medicinal value. There, there was this idea that the saliva of really important people could carry kind of like their influence and their power. And so there's a little bit of like, maybe he's acting in a way that this man expects him to heal him. Like maybe he's kind of like working within how he sees healings happen. There's also the idea that it's, it's similar to Genesis where God bre combines his breath with the dirt to make Adam. That's the idea of he's, cre he's actually creating what is lacking in this man. Then there's the idea that he was just bored. And Jesus was like, well, here's a new way. Like I don't, we don't know. But what we do know is he tells the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which we don't know how far away that is. It never gives us context for where he is, right? I could say, go wash in the Atlantic Ocean, and if we're at the Jersey Beach, that's not a big deal. If I said that today, you'd be like, uh-uh, that ain't happening. It's too cold. I'm not driving and walking that far. Like, that's a long distance. So we don't know where he is, but he tells him specifically to go to this one pool, and this man obeys. Think about it. He doesn't yell at Jesus or try to fight him for making mud and spitting on him. He also doesn't wipe the mud off right away and say, okay, that didn't work. They, the scriptures say that he went to the pool and came back seeing. So the most likely de explanation for that is the miracle didn't occur until he obeyed and washed in the correct pool. So he doesn't stop and wash it off in a different set of water and see what works. This man seizes the moment to obey Jesus. In its simplest form, seizing miracle moments, seizing the divine moments, is just choosing to obey. And not picking and choosing. You know, this, we can think of this word obedience, and we have some weird definitions of what it means to obey, right? Like, we can look at obedience and be like, I did most of what I was supposed to do. That, that's not obedience, right? So if, about two years ago, I, uh, was, I was being super strict on my diet. And so I, I, I'm already kind of strict. You know, I talk about I have one cheat day a week right now. I was being so strict that I was doing like 30 days with no cheat day. I was going after some goals. And, and so I really want it. It was like the fall. And I'm, it's okay. I own it. I love pumpkin everything. I love pumpkin flavored everything. I own that stereotype. I have no problem with that stereotype. It is who I am. I love pumpkin. And so it's, it's, it's fall and I really wanted to make pumpkin pancakes. But on my diet, I couldn't have pancakes. But I found a protein pumpkin pancake recipe that fit my macros. And so I was all excited, and I, made, I got all ready to make this protein pumpkin pancake recipe. And I got all the ingredients, and there were a few things I was missing, but I was like, meh, close enough. I'll make substitutions. And so I mixed it all together, and I made it, and followed this recipe. Well, followed this recipe, right? Like, left out major ingredients and replaced them with things that were in my house, because I didn't want to leave my house. And I make it, and it looks really good. Like, it looks like, oh, it's like, oh, it's gonna be great. You even take a picture, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna put this on Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> like, I never do that kind of stuff, but I'm finally gonna do that kind of stuff, because like, yeah, like cooking, hashtag what, right? <laughs> and Christina and I sit down to eat it, and it tasted like wet cat food in the middle. <laughs> and in that moment, I realized, yeah, following the recipe means following the recipe. <laughs> like, I couldn't get angry at the recipe for being bad. I changed the ingredients. I picked and chose what I wanted to obey. We can do that with our faith, though. We can look at the scriptures, we can look at God, and we can go, oh, well, I, I agree with this, and I don't agree with that, or I, I agree with this, or I don't. Well, why? Because we think we know better. We think, well, I, I understand my life. You know, what's funny is I didn't pick and choose what I obeyed when I went skydiving. 
When they told me at what velocity I'm supposed to pull the string, I pulled the string. <laughs> when they told me the exact way you're supposed to fall out of a plane, at first I was like, you're telling me there's a right and wrong way to fall out of a plane? Like, so you're saying free falling, there's a wrong way to free fall. Like, that doesn't make sense. And they're like, oh no, you could like break your spine. I was like, yep, how do I practice this thing? Where? And like our whole group practiced how to free fall, which sounds like a contradiction, right? Like it's no longer free fall, it's practiced fall, right? Like, but they told me what to do and I followed every instruction. Why? Because I don't want to die. I've never gone skydiving before now. You've supposedly done a couple hundred of them. I'm trusting you because you've seen how this works out. God is eternal. He sees the end of the story. Who's got a better vantage point? Who knows how this is going to work out in the end? If we want to see miraculous moments, if we want to see these moments be used for incredible things for God, we have to be willing to fully obey. Where are you making pumpkin pancakes? Where are you picking and choosing what God says is true? It's either total obedience or no obedience at all. And the incredible thing is a lot of times we hold back because we're afraid. And we're afraid of, well, what if it doesn't work out or what if I don't understand enough? God promises that if we trust him and obey it, it will make sense. That if we hold to his teachings, then we will know the truth and be set free. The whole thing starts with trust. My second and final point is missionary moments. So the first way of having these miraculous moments is by obedience, and the second way is actually really cool too. It's about the mission. So jump down to verse 24. So what happens is this man gets healed, and he's having an emotional roller coaster of a day. He, he gets healed, and he's having an awesome time. He's fired up. He can finally see. Like, just think about his life for a minute. He went from never seeing to all of a sudden it's in living color. Like, people lost their minds when the Wizard of Oz went from black and white to color right? He went from nothing to full vision. You got to be thinking, he's like, oh, Bobby, that's what you look like. Oh, no wonder you're still single, right? Like, you think about like all this stuff, he goes through his head like, whoa, like, you just think like for the first time he sees things, right? And he's, he's shocked. <laughs> that's not about our singles, guys. It's just a joke. <laughs> Man, I, I, oops. Uh, <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> If your name's Bob, that wasn't toward you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you think about it, and like his whole his mind has got to be blown. And he goes on that high note, and then he walks back to the temple, and he's like, "Guys, I can see!" And they're like, "We're gonna kick you out of the synagogue because you got healed on the Sabbath." He's like, "What is happening?" And then the Pharisees begin attacking him because they want to discredit Jesus, and he's brought to stand trial. For what happens and so he tells them the events and they don't believe him they they so doubt him they bring his parents in to to testify whether or not he really was blind and, and in verse 24 it says a second time they summoned the man who had been blind give glory to god by telling the truth well that doesn't mean like oh praise god with your life what that means is like you are under oath don't you lie to me they said we know this man is a sinner he replied speaking of the once blind man whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? It's like mic drop. Uh, here's this man in He's brought before trial, and here are the religious leaders, people who, who know everything about the Old Testament, and they're quizzing him, and he goes, listen, man, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I know one thing. I was blind, but now I can see. What's incredible is this man seizes his first moment by obeying Jesus and is healed. He's brought on trial, and he seizes his second moment by making God known. And he stands before this trial of people who know so much more than him in the Scriptures, and he's unafraid. He goes, listen, I may not know your answers, but I know what Jesus did to my life. You got to choose whether or not you're going to believe. He seizes his missionary moment. And you think about it, and all of us 
have some form of a story about what's brought us here. Now, we may not be biblical scholars. You may not know a lot about the Bible. There may be a lot that you feel like people around you know more than you do, or you may know that people around you don't necessarily think the right things about God, but you don't know what the right things are. Like, you know when you know someone's wrong, but you don't know how to tell them, like, you don't know what's right? Like, you've ever had that feeling? Right? So you can get in that spot too, but the truth is none of that matters. What matters is the moment to share what God has done for you, to share your story. You know, we sat down in the cafeteria the other night to have a follow-up study with Ellis, and, and we're helping Ellis, you know, just, he decided to get baptized, and now we stay in his life, and amen, we got to keep each other helping grow, and we sit down, and we do kind of a follow-up study, and as we start, this guy gets up and kind of walks around us like three times slowly, and I was like, well, what is this? Like, and we're at a small table, and the guy kind of walked around us, and then he stopped and kind of looked at us, and I was like, hey, man, he goes, can I join you? We're like, of course, sit down. He sat down, he's like, I'm... He's like, I'm really trying to figure out my faith right now. And so we paused the whole thing, and, and in about a minute and a half, I just told him a quick version of my story. Because he's in the middle of studying for finals. He doesn't have 20 minutes. He, his books, his, his laptop, everything was still open at the table behind us. He only had a moment. And so I shared my story and asked him if he wants to study the Bible. And he said, you know, I, I think I might. Let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. And we exchanged numbers, and, and we've been talking a little bit since. Do you have an elevator version of your conversion story? In an elevator, could you tell someone the glory that God has done in your life? Now, we all could sit down for hours and talk about it, amen? Can you share it in 45 seconds? Can you highlight what God has done in under a minute? We need to be prepared as men and women ready to share what God has done because those moments are just moments. But from that moment, God can do anything. You know, I could end it there, but the truth is, about a week before that, I totally missed a moment. So me, Dan, and Spence all went out to Wegmans one day, because I think we need to get something for Christina or for our potluck or something. And so we go to Wegmans, and as we're walking in, you know, me being the evangelist and trying to push each other, we're like, all right, guys, each one of us gets one invite card. We can't leave here until we invite someone. And I was like, and Christina's got to leave for work, so we only have, like, a limited amount of time, so, like, we can't chicken out. Everyone, Amen. So we get in line, and I'm standing in line, and I'm, you know, Wegmans is kind of packed, and so I'm standing in line, and there's a guy next to me who, who's got like a Wegmans like pizza dough thing, and it looks like he's going to make his own pizza, and I had just watched a video that morning about how to make your own pizza because I'm obsessed with food. You guys should know that by now. And so I turned to him, I was like, hey, man, you're making your own pizza. And he goes, yeah. I was like, oh, why are you doing that instead of this? And he's like, oh, okay. And we talked about pizza for a minute, and I had this connection with him in the middle of the store, and I was like, I'm going to share my faith with that guy. And I was like, I'll wait till we both check out. Because it was like, at that point, we're like talking through the candy bars in the checkout line. So then I go and I pay. And I was like, in my head, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to get him after we're done. Finish paying, look up, and he just vanished. He pulled a Houdini. And so, and, and Dan and Spence can test this. I was like, no, where'd he go? And like, we like ran out the door. And I'm like, in the like looking for him. And he just was gone. I missed a moment. That's all it is, is when you make eye contact with someone, when someone's wearing a shirt about something you like. Like for me, I see Tough Mudder or Yeti on anything, and we talking about Jesus. Because we can connect about something there, right? That if you make eye contact, if they're wearing a shirt for a band you like, if you happen to laugh at this, in the line together, those little moments are an opportunity to share what God has done in your life and to ask them whether or not they want to learn more. We have those moments every day. It's just whether or not we let them pass by. All it takes is 10 seconds of faith. You want to see a miracle? You want to change a life? You don't need to be the bravest person you've ever met. You don't need to be rock solid in your beliefs. You, you don't need to be doubt free. All you need is to have enough faith for 10 seconds. You be completely faithless at second 12. If you have 10 seconds of faith, 10 seconds of boldness, God can use that. It only takes a moment. What moment is God calling you in your life? Where in your life is a moment passing by? Are you given the chance to obey, to decide to go fully in and to follow Jesus with all you have? Why are you hesitating? You gotta deal and sit down and say, this is my moment to answer these questions. Let me get real about my doubts and my fears and see what God has to say. Where in your life is God giving you moments to change lives around you? Little connections that you can use to tell 
your story. Brothers and sisters, as long as it is light, we must do the works of God. I implore you this week, don't let the sun go down on those moments. Look for the moments and choose to have 10 seconds of faith to seize them. Amen? To God be the glory. We're going to have one final song.